y'all, it's not rude, I'm going to just sit for a little while. I'm a little, a tiny bit warm, and this is such a pleasure for me, because this is one of these kind of days where I've been sort of changing my head every 20 minutes. So, you know, we were big meeting in, in Christchurch this morning with a lot of activists, and then off to the Good Morning TV program, and you have, you have to change your head a little bit, you know, and then we were just with lots and lots of... Uh, uh, of high school students uh, down the road who are planning all kinds of things, and that was different too. It's a real pleasure. <clears throat> I feel like I can relax a little bit um, that I'm in this sort of company of my peers and colleagues who understand exactly uh, where we are and what's going on. And I want to tell you just a little bit about this global thing that we've got going that kind of complement to all the efforts, to all the local efforts that y'all are, are doing such a good job with. I know you know all the science, so I'm not going to bother barely saying anything, except that just to sort of make it clear why we have this sense of huge urgency right now. Um, as Aaron, and one of the great things about this trip has been getting to know Aaron and seeing the kind of level of organizing that young people, especially in New Zealand, are up to right now. Um, <laughs> As uh, 20 years ago, I wrote this book, on, the first book on climate change. So I've watched the kind of consensus develop over those decades, okay, and seen it get strong. And, and then about 18 months ago, seen that consensus turn into a kind of panic, at least on the cutting edge of the science, okay? The signal event is the melt of sea ice, some sea ice in the Arctic, way ahead of schedule, you know? Um, um, 50 years ahead of what we thought would happen. We clearly crossed this big threshold. Clearly the Earth is groaning in ways that we hadn't thought were gonna happen quite yet, okay? And of course it reminded us very quickly not only of how much the world was warming, but of how much that began to feed back upon itself, you know, no more nice white mirror to reflect 80% of the sun's incoming rays back out to space, now blue water to absorb 80% of that. And the same thing beginning to happen with the methane releases from beneath the permafrost in, in, in the Siberian and Canadian tundra, and on and on and on. In the fall of, or late fall of 2007, our greatest climatologist in the States, anyway, and maybe in the world, James Hansen at NASA, an old and dear friend of mine, uh, he and his team produced a paper that finally gave us what I think we've needed in many ways all along to work with, which is a real number, a real target, a real sense of how much really is too much. And I think it's not... Um, exaggerated to say that the number they gave us, 350, as in parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, is the most important number on Earth. Um, as they put in the abstract of that peer-reviewed scientific paper, any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 is not compatible with the planet upon which civilization developed or to which life on Earth is adapted. Strong language. And of course, all the stronger, since you all know that we're past 350, that we're at 387 and rising, and that that's why the Arctic's melting. That's why Australia is catching on fire. That's why drought in you know, epic quantities is spreading around the world, on and on and on. I don't need to tell you any of that. The basic political meaning of all of this is that we have to figure out how to move much faster than we thought we were going to, okay? And much faster than is economically convenient, politically convenient, socially convenient. We have to force the pace enormously of the change that we need. The best science makes us think that the window we have to act is very, very short. Rajendra Prachari, the Indian-born scientist who's head of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, said <clears throat> a couple of a few months ago that if we have not begun to make fundamental changes 
by 2012, then the momentum of these feedback loops from best we can tell may be strong enough that we don't, won't no longer have the, that is, the change we make past that point will be somewhat symbolic and empiric. It won't allow us to get a grip on things, okay? That's a very obviously scary dilemma to be in. You all are political organizers. You know how change slowly change usually happens, how hard it is to force rapid change. Um, there's, as far as, you know, as far as we can tell, there are three parts to this process, you know. Um, we've got to figure out how to raise the price of carbon fast. The only lever big enough to move things in the time that we need to move them is by really making the cost of carbon reflect the damage that it does in the environment, okay? That we can't do this, important as it is to make local and personal change, you can't make the map work one light bulb at a time, one campus at a time, one anything at a time. Addition doesn't get you there. We have to figure out how to multiply, and the only way to do that is with the injecting that piece of information about the reality of the planet into every economic and investment decision that gets made by every person and every company every day. So if that's the first thing we got to do, the second thing we got to do is, you know, that's a political step to put that piece of information in. The only way that can happen is if we get national but especially international agreements to put a cap on carbon and hence put a price on it. Okay? And the only real chance we're going to get is December of this year with this Copenhagen conference. We used to think that this would be kind of an evolutionary step. We'd take the Kyoto Accords a little bit further and include some more nations and toughen the target. Given what the science tells us, this is our last plausible bite at the apple. Get the architecture right this time. Get a treaty stiff enough this time. Or all we really do for the rest of the century and centuries to come is figure out how on earth to adapt to that which we can no longer really stop. Okay, so that's part two. We need the political. So how do you get that political agreement? Only way that we're going to do it is if we manage to build, and this is a real, to some degree, a real long shot. If we manage to build what we haven't built to date, which is a strong political movement between now and the end of the year, that is able to really push this change. 